with the Sogdian revolt crushed, Alexander, despite growing divisions in his army, set his sights beyond the borders of the Persian Empire and onto the Indian subcontinent. Motivated in equal parts by strategic and personal reasons, the Indian campaign, which took place mostly in modern Afghanistan and Pakistan, would prove to be one of Alexander's costliest and may even have ultimately led to his death. In this episode, we will look at how his army's divisions culminated in one of the most serious attempts on his life and discuss the opening, often overlooked, Coffin Campaign. If you're liking our series on Alexander, we'll also recommend a documentary by our sponsor Magellan TV, the first episode of their Great Commanders series. It's a summary of Alexander's life from start to finish, with a focus on key battles like Issus and Gorgamela, and interviews with expert historians to help tell the tale. But that's only the start of the series. There are also five more episodes covering the exploits of Julius Caesar, Horatio Nelson, Napoleon Bonaparte, Ulysses S. Grant, and Georgi Zhukov, exploring what it was about these leaders that allowed them to change the world so much with their military skills. And Magellan TV has plenty more to offer. They boast the richest and most varied history content available anywhere, covering everything from the ancient to modern eras, wars, biographies, and the Earth itself, Aside from history, they've got extensive collections of science, true crime, travel, and other documentaries. They add 15 or more hours of 4K high-definition content every week for their subscribers at no extra cost. It's all viewable anytime, anywhere, on televisions, laptops, mobile devices, and more. Get access to 3,500 hours of ad-free documentaries for only $4.99 a month, and get a month for free by subscribing to Magellan TV via our link in the description. In the aftermath of the Sogdian Revolt, Alexander began preparing his forces for the campaign, moving from Marikanda to Bactra. While there, the Persianization of Alexander came to arguably its most dramatic climax. It was customary in the Persian court for those entering the presence of the great king to perform proskinesis, prostrating oneself on the ground and kissing the floor or the feet of the king. The Persians were now dutifully performing this ceremonial act for Alexander, who began suggesting that his officers should follow suit. His motivation for doing so is unclear, but many of his Hellenic officers and advisers were firmly against the idea, none more so than the historian and philosopher Callisthenes. At one point, while Alexander's companions were discussing the topic outside of his presence, Callisthenes reportedly said, Divinity sometimes overtakes a man but it never accompanies him. I am not ashamed of my fatherland, nor do I desire to learn from the vanquished how I ought to honour my king. They are the victors if we accept from them the laws under which we live." These words certainly encapsulated how many men felt. They were also reported to Alexander, painting a target on the back of Callisthenes. While in Bactra, Alexander led a royal hunt with his companions and the royal pages. It was the right of the king to have the first kill, but on this occasion, one of the pages, Hemelos, struck first, killing a boar that Alexander was aiming for, in return for which Alexander had the young man beaten. Infuriated and humiliated, Hemelos began plotting to assassinate Alexander, recruiting several other pages to partake in the plot. Part of the duties of the royal pages was to guard the king while he slept, and so they planned to strike while Alexander was sleeping. It took them 32 days to arrange their guard duties so that there would be no one else to interfere with their plans, but finally the moment came. Alexander was at a drinking party, and the conspirators were all on guard duty, prepared to strike once Alexander returned. However, through sheer chance, Alexander either decided to drink all through the night or went to leave but was convinced to stay out by a drunk woman. By the time Alexander made for bed, it was morning and new guards had arrived to take over the duties of Hermelaus and his comrades. They had, nonetheless, hung around with the new guards, hoping for an opportunity to strike. A drunk Alexander approached and greeted them warmly, thanking them for staying guard throughout the night and even longer than was expected of them. He gave each a monetary reward in gratitude and sent them home. It was undoubtedly one of the most incredibly lucky escapes in history. 
The next day, one of the conspirators, Epimenes, had a change of heart, and the details were soon passed on to Ptolemy and Leonatus, two of Alexander's personal bodyguards. No doubt remembering the fate of Philotus, they immediately woke Alexander and told him of the plot. Epimenes was spared, but Hermelaus and the other conspirators were arrested. Callisthenes had not been implicated, but part of his duties was to educate the pages, and so he too was arrested. The following account of the trial is based largely from Rufus, who gives the most detail. It is important therefore to note that Rufus was writing during the first century of the Roman Empire, and that the speeches he puts in Hermelaus' mouth may reflect his own political views. Nevertheless, his account certainly embodies feelings and accusations common among all the extant histories of Alexander, and are thus likely a fair reflection of what at least some people at the time felt. Furthermore, just because Rufus may have seen parallels between Alexander and later Roman emperors, it does not negate the fact that the same grievances may have existed. The pages were brought in front of Alexander to stand trial, Callisthenes remaining in prison for the time being. Their parents and relatives were also present, no doubt nervous considering the fate of Parmenion when Philotas had been convicted. The pages all confessed and Alexander demanded to know what he had done that warranted his murder. Hermelaus arguing that it was because he treated his subjects as slaves, and that he used men for murder and then discarded or killed them, like Philotas, Parmenion and Cletus. Twice Hermelaus' father rushed forward to silence his son, at one point even snatching up a sword and preparing to kill him. Both times he was restrained, and Hermelaus was ordered to continue. Hermelaus began to unleash a tirade of accusations against Alexander, saying that Alexander only kept Callisthenes imprisoned because he was scared about what the historian would have to say and stressing that Callisthenes had nothing to do with the attempted assassination. Hermelaus also claimed that Alexander had, through his adoption of Persian dress, Persian customs and Persian advisers, made himself the king of Persia. He had not, he therefore claimed, planned to kill the king of Macedonia, he had planned to kill a deserter and the king of Persia. Alexander had scorned Macedonian customs, acted like a god, treated his men like slaves, and they were sick of it. Hermelaus asked for his relatives to be spared, but requested that he and his conspirators should be executed, so that they could, at the very least, die showing how Alexander treated his subjects. Alexander, however, had his own response. He argued that Hermelaus was motivated largely by the beating Alexander had ordered he receive, pointing out that this was the right of Macedonian kings, and that part of the role of being a page was to be disciplined in such ways, saying, orders are made mild by obedience. He pointed out all the riches, glory and honour that the men he led had reaped thanks to him and that he had not invaded Persia to destroy the empire, but to conquer it, arguing that the only way that they would rule as conquerors was if the Persians accepted them. With regard to the accusation that he had embraced Persian customs, Alexander responded, True, for I see in many nations things we should not blush to imitate. Alexander continued, pointing out that he had not asked to be a god, but that he had nonetheless been proclaimed as the son of one. He had embraced this idea because it was advantageous to do so, stating that war depends on reputation and that Macedonians needed to be considered invincible. He concluded by saying that the relatives would be spared and that he had never intended to kill them, and the reason that Callisthenes was not present was because he was an Olynthian, a Greek. Alexander had done Hermelaus and the pages, all Macedonians, the courtesy of seeing them first. Hermelaus and his fellow pages were executed after the trial. Callisthenes likely followed soon after, executed without a trial. However, some sources do instead record that he was simply kept imprisoned for the rest of his life and died of disease. The pages plot was the assassination attempt that so far had come closest to killing Alexander, and there's still no certainty whether or not Callisthenes was involved. Rufus and Plutarch categorically state that Callisthenes was not, while Arian notes that Aristobulus and Ptolemy, both contemporaries of the event, 
said Callisthenes was named as a conspirator, although Arian doubts that this is true. Broadly, this is the same consensus as modern historians. While some sources do claim that Callisthenes had previously told Hermolaus that he was a man and deserved to be treated as one, or that if he wanted glory he could easily achieve it by killing the most famous man of all, it is unclear how true these claims are, or if they are later fabrications to exonerate Alexander. Most modern historians see the episode as yet another occasion where Alexander used the conspiracy to clean house and remove a critic. In the Roman writer Seneca's words, it was the eternal crime of Alexander, which no virtue or felicity of his in war shall ever be able to redeem. Alexander's preparations for the Indian campaign continued. His motivations for the invasion were numerous. Parts of the subcontinent had been under Persian rule, and they had committed soldiers to the Persian war effort, even as recently as the Battle of Gorgamela, both giving Alexander justification for his invasion. He also may have hoped to make it to the outer ocean, the modern Indian Ocean, to have it form the eastern border of his empire. There were also strong personal motivations, such as Alexander's desire to emulate, and possibly even outdo, Cyrus the Great, Heracles and Dionysus, who were regular sources of inspiration for Alexander and had links to the area. Diplomatic missions had already begun, mainly with the kingdoms and tribes along the Indus River, some of whom, such as the king of Taxila, had already paid tribute and sworn allegiance to Alexander, providing him with a toehold in the area. Alexander also, according to ancient sources, amassed an army of 120,000 infantry and 15,000 cavalry, though modern historians question how logistically realistic this number is often preferring a number closer to 70,000, including the baggage train. Leaving approximately 10,000 men to keep Bactria in check, Alexander advanced towards the subcontinent. Alexander decided to split his army into two parts, targeting the Coffin Valley. The first, consisting of approximately 5,000 infantry, 2,000 cavalry, and Indian allies under the command of Hephaestion and Perdiccas, would secure Alexander's foothold in the region. They would follow the Kabul River and march through the Khyber Pass, areas that had pledged allegiance to Alexander, ensuring loyalty and eventually reaching the Indus, where they would prepare boats and a pontoon bridge for crossing. Alexander, meanwhile, would take the rest of the force to secure their rear by marching along the Kunar River through Bajor and Swat, areas where Alexander had not received any embassies from before reuniting with Hephaestion and Perdiccas at the Indus. For the most part, Hephaestion and Perdiccas made good progress, meeting little resistance, with the majority of the locals in the area affirming their loyalty to Alexander. There was only one city, Pukalautis, that offered significant resistance, but it was taken after a 30-day siege and the force pushed on to the Indus to prepare the crossing. Alexander's route, however, proved to be far more difficult. The Aspasians, one of the first peoples he came across, retreated to their cities and to the mountains, forcing Alexander to siege them individually. During one of these sieges, Alexander was once again wounded, only being saved by his breastplate, Ptolemy and Leonatus also being wounded. The city, for its resistance, was leveled and the prisoners were killed. Soon after, Alexander was able to catch the remnants of the Aspasian force along with their king and defeated them, Ptolemy killing the king personally. Alexander next faced a large force of Goraeans, a people regarded as being particularly warlike, who had taken up a strong defensive position on high ground. In order to lure the enemy into battle, Alexander split his army into three parts. Leonatus being given command of approximately 6,000 infantry, including 1,000 hypaspists, Ptolemy commanding 1,000 hypaspists, 3,000 of the phalanx and Agrianians, and half the horse archers. Both these divisions were placed on the flanks and advanced out of sight of the enemy. Alexander, meanwhile, commanded the rest of the army and advanced to the center. The Goraeans, only seeing Alexander's outnumbered part of the army, charged down from the high ground to attack Alexander's center. As they did so, Leonatus and Ptolemy advanced with their forces on the flanks. Ptolemy's flank faced particularly stiff resistance, 
but Alexander and Leonatus were having much greater success, and eventually, attacked on three sides, the Goraeans broke, with Arian claiming that 40,000 were taken prisoner, though it is unclear how accurate that figure is. Alexander pushed on into the lands of the Asikeni. They refused to give battle in the open, instead falling back to their cities, Alexander pursuing and preparing to lay siege to their capital, Masaga. Masaga, however, had hired 7,000 well-trained and disciplined mercenaries to assist them, and when Alexander drew near, they sallied out. Alexander quickly halted his advance, ordering his men to withdraw to a nearby hill, hoping to lure the enemy away from their city walls. The Asakeni, thinking Alexander was retreating, broke ranks as they charged. As they closed in, however, Alexander ordered his missiles to turn and fire, simultaneously charging them with his light cavalry. The Asakeni were caught out of formation, and lost 200 in this initial skirmish, before falling back to their city. Alexander pushed on, besieging the city and preparing siege works for an assault. The first assault, aimed at breaking down the walls, was repulsed by the defenders, Alexander receiving another minor wound. The next nine days were spent building a large siege tower to attack the walls. When it was completed, the tower was rolled forward, with archers and slingers on the top, firing missiles onto the defenders to try and clear them from the walls. The tower's bridge was then extended, Alexander ordering the Hypaspids forward to attack. However, too many attempted to cross the bridge at once, and it crumbled, many Hypaspids crashing to the ground. Many were wounded by their fall, and the defenders unleashed a barrage of arrows and stones into them. Alexander quickly sent 1,500 footmen to recover as many of the wounded as possible. The bridge was repaired, and another attack was mounted the following day, which was once again repulsed. However, during the attack, the king of the Masaga was killed, and his wife, Cleophis, began negotiations of surrender. Alexander promised to spare the city, so long as the Askeni pledged allegiance to him and the mercenaries joined his army. These terms were agreed to the mercenaries and their families leaving the city and camping on a hill near Alexander's force. However, once they were all gathered there, Alexander ordered his army to surround and attack them. The mercenaries fought back bravely, forming a circle with their families in the center and desperately shouting to Alexander that he was breaking the peace agreement. The attack continued nevertheless, Diodorus even claiming that some of the women took up the weapons of their fallen husbands to fight back. By the end of it, all of the mercenaries and their families had either been cut down or taken prisoner. Arian, in his account, claimed that the mercenaries had been planning to scatter during the night, which was what had provoked Alexander's actions. He is, however, alone in making this claim. Even if this was the case, however, it would not change the fact that Alexander knowingly broke a peace treaty, an act of treachery that both Plutarch and Diodorus view as a serious blight on Alexander's career. The result of Alexander's actions was that the remaining Eskeni became even more resolute, most taking refuge in a fortress atop the Ornos mountain, possibly the modern Pirsar. It was a place, like the Sogdian and Karenese rock, that was considered impregnable, the mountain surrounded by a river and various crags. Nonetheless, taking it was essential for Alexander's strategy, in order for him to have full control of the Coffin Valley and allow him to progress to the Indus with his rear secure. Alexander advanced on the fortress with perhaps 10,000 men, leaving the rest with Craterus to forage for supplies. The fortress itself was located on the mountain's eastern summit, Alexander approaching and encamping at the base. A local offered for a reward to show Alexander a path to an advantageous position, an offer Alexander gladly accepted, offering 80 talents. Following this guide, Ptolemy led the Agrianians, light infantry, and a few hundred Hypaspists along a circuitous mountain path, avoiding detection by the enemy until they were in position on the western summit. When there, Ptolemy reinforced his position with a barricade, and used fires to signal his success to Alexander. It seems that Alexander was planning to use the same tactics he had used at the Sogdian Rock, threatening to attack the Asakeni from two sides. He advanced with his main force the next day to attack but the terrain proved too difficult, and he was forced to withdraw. The Asakeni seized the opportunity, and instead attacked the position of Ptolemy, 
trying to dislodge his force. Ptolemy's group was outnumbered, but well dug in and fought back desperately, the fighting continuing throughout the day and only ending with nightfall. Ptolemy's force had managed to repulse the attackers, but the Asakeni did seem to have managed to keep a force in the area to overlook the mountain path Ptolemy had taken. With the initial plan having failed, Alexander changed tactics. A part of the army was left guarding the paths around the mountain to maintain the siege, while the rest of his army went up the path Ptolemy had taken and rejoined him. As they marched up this path, they were continuously harassed by arrows and stones, with many men being wounded and progress being slow. It may have taken as many as two days, but eventually Alexander's army gained the summit, reuniting with Ptolemy. However, ravines still made an approach to the fortress itself difficult. As a result, just as he had done at the Rock of Kerenes, Alexander ordered the construction of a bridge in order to get his siege weapons into position. Working day and night, his engineers began construction of the bridge, wooden screens being used to protect them as much as possible from enemy fire, and using his missile troops to hold off sallies from the Asakeni. After four days, the bridge was completed and the engines were brought into position. The Asakeni, at this point, saw the writing on the wall. What happened next is not entirely clear. According to Arian, the Asakeni offered peace terms, but then attempted to slip away the following night. Rufus, on the other hand, claims that for two nights, the Asakeni loudly beat drums and kept torches lit throughout the night, and then on the third night, lit all the torches as usual and then tried to escape the fortress. Whichever was the case, Alexander discovered the attempt and ordered his men maintaining the siege to stand down, allowing the Asakeni to begin their retreat. He then rushed the fortress with 700 men, falling upon the Asakeni rear as they retreated, while the men guarding the base of the mountain simultaneously attacked. A significant number managed to escape, but the rest were captured and enslaved. Due to the contradictory nature of our available sources, it is not clear if this was yet another case of Alexander treacherously breaking a peace, or if he had seen through the ruse and predicted the withdrawal. With the fortress taken, the Coffin Valley was subdued, and Alexander marched to the Indus, reuniting with Hephaestion and Perdiccas, and crossed his whole army across the Indus using the pontoon bridge prepared for them. From here, he marched to the allied Taxila, receiving more allied local forces, including elephants, while doing so. At Taxila, he rested his men for a while and inquired about other tribes in the area. It was here that Alexander learned of two hostile local kings, Abyseres and Porus. The latter, who was the more powerful of the two, had amassed his army on the banks of the Hydaspes River, determined to halt Alexander's advance. Despite the monsoon rains, Alexander left Taxila and advanced in the spring of 326 to the Hydaspes. We will cover the famous battle that happened there in our next video, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.